Hey, what's going on guys and welcome to another crack a pack episode. Uh, we are going to be opening up a pack of 2012 core set today, but before we do, I just want to go ahead and apologize. We did not get the last two crack a packs up. Uh, I had actually been in South Korea as I think I mentioned prior, but uh, in addition, uh, I was actually sick. I got strep throat while in Korea and so I was still kind of getting over that and with strep throat I didn't feel like recording was the best idea. Uh, so I do apologize, but we are back. I'm very, very excited to be opening up this pack. Of course, we are going to look at this uh, through the eyes of a draft perspective. So we're going to figure out hopefully what a reasonable first round uh, pick would be if we were drafting this set. As such, we are going to go through every card, and our first one here is Bonebreaker Giant. It is a 4-4 four, four for 4 and a red vanilla creature. Uh, not super exciting. Uh, for for red, this would be very, very top end for like a red deck wins in draft. Uh, I don't like this card very much. There's not really any, really any upside to it. Uh, it's a 4-4 four, four for 5, so it's a little bit behind the curve in terms of uh, power to efficiency ratio. Uh, and on top of that, it is in red, and I'd prefer to keep my ground creatures small and very, very fast. That's kind of the idea. So, not super excited by this card by any means. Definitely not first pickable. Uh, Stampeding Rhino is a 4-4 four, four for 4 and a green as well, but it does have Trample. Uh, so, this having that keyword Trample does make a big difference. Uh, this still is not necessary. It's it's definitely not a first pickable card, but it is much more of a playable card uh, because it's going to be able to get damage in a little bit easier. So the Bonebreaker Giant, they can chump block for days. They could trade. That's fine. However, with the Stampeding Rhino, they can't. I mean, they can chump block they want if they want to to save some damage, uh, but it's going to kill the creature and deal damage to the opponent. So there's a little bit of a bonus with a card like this. Not to mention this is in green, and so it's a little bit easier to ramp into it. Uh, at least on uh, that's the general perspective of green. Uh, so for sure, I would definitely take the Rhino above the Giant. However, not really super interested in either one, to be honest. Uh, Gideon's Law Keeper is a 1-1 one, one for 1 white. You can pay a white, tap it, and then tap target creature. This is uh, the perfect kind of card that you want for draft. Uh, it nullifies a singular creature on the opponent's side of the field uh, when it comes to attacking or defending, which is definitely important. Uh, this can come out very, very early, so it can save you a lot of damage in the early game as well. And then on top of that, uh, it's just a really efficient card. I mean, it's a 1-1 one, one for 1, and it only takes one white and then tapping this creature to actually use its ability. So for all of these reasons, I love this card. This is an absolute, uh, not I won't say powerhouse, but it's an absolute uh, playable, very, very playable card, uh, and one that I'm definitely interested in. <laughs> Uh, Grave Digger is a very classic card. It's a 2-2 for 3 and a black. When it enters the battlefield, you may return target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. Uh, I do like this card quite a lot. This is a good one. Uh, it's very, very nice to be able to not only get a body out there, but also then pull back a creature uh, that your opponents already had to deal with and then make them deal with it again, uh, especially if that's kind of your big swinging bomb or something like that. Obviously, that means this card's better in the late game, but you're going to be playing it in the mid to late game anyway because it is four mana. A little expensive, obviously, but uh, for for the effect that you're getting, it's fantastic. Uh, I don't know if it's technically better than Lawkeeper. I'm going to keep them in the same pile right now, and we'll see where things pan out. Uh, Amphin Cutthroat is a 2-4 vanilla creature for three and a blue. Absolutely not interested in this at all. I absolutely hate this card. Uh, a 2-4 for, f uh, for 4 mana? That's bad. That's real bad. Uh, it has a decent butt, uh, but that's about it. So not excited by this at all, just not even worth talking about. In the same vein, Siege Mastodon, a 3-5 for 4 and a white. Very uninteresting as well. It's vanilla has no abilities, doesn't deal enough damage, might survive a little bit, but honestly at 5, you're probably going to be dealing with other creatures that have maybe 5 uh, power as well, and so it it's really not that good. Uh, that's where these like big butt creatures just tend to fail, is that they're not actually presenting a threat. Uh, at the time that you play them, they may be able to stick around for a bit because they do have a good bit of toughness, that's kind of it though. All they're doing is blocking these lower ground creatures. They're going to get outpowered and they're not going to be able to swing in and deal a lot of damage because they just don't have the power to do so. And so for a lot of reasons, I absolutely hate cards like this. Just not even worth it. Uh, Stonehorn Dignitary is a 1-4 for 3 and a white. When it enters the battlefield, 
Target opponent skips his or her next combat phase. Uh, this is a really interesting card and maybe a blue uh, white tempo deck or something along those lines. I honestly don't know how good this is. Uh, it could be very, very good and I might be missing it. On the face of it, I feel like it's just okay. Uh, it is a tempo swing. It slows your opponents down. They're not going to be able to deal as much damage to you. Uh, and I like that. That's great. However, there are going to be decks that this doesn't do quite as much with. Uh, decks that are maybe just trying to play some pingers or play some lower stuff and then deal a lot with spells, which obviously is not normally the focus of a draft deck. However, uh, that does happen. And in that instance, this is very uninteresting. Uh, you might save yourself a few damage because of maybe some flyer or something like that, but generally speaking, it's not going to be the most impactful in those situations. In other situations, it's going to be fantastic. If you've got a, you're up against a big creature deck, a go-wide strategy, something like that, absolutely, this is going to save you some damage and get you there. Uh, and I like that. And it does have a big enough butt that it's going to be able to block uh, at least something some low ground creatures but again it's not dealing a lot of damage it's only got one power uh, so it's not like it's an aggressive card by any means and it's not like it's going to be killing that much uh, and so for that reason i don't think that this is as good as the other two cards we have here uh, so i would pass over that uh, zombie goliath is a 4-3 for four and a black vanilla creature a lot of vanilla creatures in this one it is a core set i suppose but this is uh, exceptionally bad in my opinion uh, for five mana, you're getting a four three. Uh, that's terrible. You could just lightning strike that. You could do so much to it to just kill it right away. Absolutely no reason to ever play this unless you just absolutely need a playable. Uh, but I do not like it. Absolutely not. Uh, Glade Cover Scout is a one one for one green with hex proof. Uh, this is actually a really interesting card. So in constructed, uh, especially modern, uh, there's the Boggles deck. This is the other Boggle, so to speak. Uh, in that it is a 1-1 one, one for 1 that has Hexproof that you can then stack tons and tons of enchant creatures on and really, really do a ton of damage very, very quickly. Uh, that, that being said, that's in Constructed. If you try and repeat that in Limited, my, my take on it is that you'll probably find it doesn't work quite as well as you'd think. That doesn't make this a bad card, though. If, you've get, if you get enough of these and enough enchantments, that can be a fantastic deck. You're just very, very dependent on not only the packs, but also what other people are taking. And I don't like to be super dependent on that. Gravedigger, uh, the Lawkeeper here, both of those cards are good on their own. This card in particular is not great on its own. It's difficult to remove, sure, but it is just a 1-1. One, one. If you get a lot of enchant creatures, it's great, but you have no idea what you're going to get. So. I prefer not to take a card like this because it is a big, bit of a speculative pick in my opinion. Uh, but that being said, there are definitely instances where it's good and uh, by all means I would try it at the very least just because it'd be fun. Uh, Merfolk Mesmerist is a 1-2 for 1 and a blue. Pay a blue and tap it. Target player puts the top two cards of his or her library into his or her graveyard. Uh, really interesting because Mill is generally considered better in Limited than it is in Constructed just because there's less cards to go through, uh, which is great, but it's always very, very difficult to actually get to work. Uh, you need so many different pieces to make Mill work. Certainly if you're in it, this is a card that you could play, but honestly, it's not that great. Uh, even on the Mill uh, end of things, there are much higher uh, rewards for being in that deck than this. If you are in that deck, uh, maybe this is a late pick for you, but I don't think in general this is a very interesting card. <clears throat> uh, our first uncommon here is Hunter's Insight. It's an instant for two and a green. Choose target creature you control, and whenever it deals combat damage to a player or planeswalker this turn, you draw that many cards. This is an interesting one. I don't know where I would rate this, to be honest. Uh, it is very good to be able to draw cards, especially in green, uh, and because you're going to be playing most likely a lot of creatures, I feel like you'll have a target for this, uh, especially if you've got something like Trample or something with, with Trample. It's very easy to get uh, some Trample damage through and be able to draw some cards. I love that prospect, but I feel like it's still going to be a little bit tricky to actually make happen. And a lot of times this could just be a dead card in your hand. And I don't like that. Uh, and so for that reason, I don't think I would first pick this by any means. Maybe if I'm in a green deck, I would try it out. But I don't think it's the kind of card that I'm interested in. Uh, well, Sarah Angel uh, is a 4-4 four, four for 3 and 2 white. It has flying and vigilance. This is what you would, in a core set in particular, definitely call a bomb. Uh, it's flying vigilance, so it's evasive. It also doesn't have to tap, so that means you can block with it even while you're attacking with it, which is great. Um, 
excuse me, but not only that, it is just a really, really good card. It's one that uh, a lot of white decks are going to want to see in their late game. Uh, and so for this to be picked up so early is definitely a smart move in my opinion. And so far the pick, uh, kind of without a doubt. Uh, Diabolic Tutor is a sorcery for two and two black. Search your library for a card and then put that card into your hand. You then shuffle your library. Uh, I think we've talked about this card pretty recently. Uh, I don't remember exactly how recently that was, but uh, I actually don't really like this card. Tutors in general, I tend to like in draft. Uh, but it's because I've played cube draft a lot, uh, where there's very, very high powered things to tutor for. And certainly there are high powered things that you can get, but it's very rare that you can tutor for them, then play that spell right away and win the game or do something crazy like that, which is what most people I feel like envision when they're thinking tutoring. Uh, for me, I find this card to be a bit slow. It's a four mana tutor. Granted, you can pull any card, put it straight into your hand. That's fantastic. Very, very good. But... Uh, I tend not to like this card, and so I would shy away from it. I'd prefer just to have a very powerful creature at four or five uh, versus having a Diabolic Tutor that goes and gets me that creature uh, that now I don't have a card slot for. So uh, I prefer just to have a better creature personally. And then our rare here is Quicksilver Amulet. It's an artifact for four mana. Uh, you can pay f pay for it and tap it, excuse me, and you can put a creature card from your from your hand onto the battlefield. This is a very, very good commander card for sure. And limited, not so sold on it. A lot of times you're gonna probably not have a great enough creature to make this worth it. That being said, if you do pick up this card, you can kind of build around it. You can start picking up a lot of just expensive creatures and try and do that. But then if you're without the amulet, it's very, very bad. So that might be an incorrect assessment. Uh, feel free to let me know in the comment sections. But I don't think that Quicksilver Amulet is the pick here. I do think it's Sarah Angel uh, pretty easily. Sarah Angel is just a great bomb for white uh, flying uh, vigilance and a 4-4. That's kind of all you want. So that would definitely be my pick. Feel free to disagree in the comment section below as always. But... If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to leave a like or a comment down below. And as always, please make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome content. It is great to be back, guys. I do, again, apologize for missing a couple episodes, but I'm happy to be back. So with that, I'm going to get out of here. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you in the next Crack-A-Pack episode.